And what's the difference between spirituality and religion? Well, the, the one summary that's been used over years, you know, is religion is for those who fear hell and spirituality is for those who have been there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what are you going to say? I mean, it's just kind of it. Um, so, it, it, and that is it in a nutshell, because religion becomes kind of a place to, to think about those things, you know, almost worry about those things, hell and, and almost gratuitously seeking God, like just doing it, going through motion. Spirituality is, is experiential. It's I want to know, not believe, not, not, not um, suspect, not kind of believe, semi-believe. It's a real, real experience. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And when I'm done, I'm going to share a couple of, of special announcements kind of along these lines. But I asked folks on my Friends of Michael Merdad Facebook page, where do you see religions going? you know, in the future, not just tomorrow, but I mean like a hundred years from now even. And I would say it was almost 50-50, at least that's my best guess. Um, a, a good number of, a good proportion of them thought, you know, it's going to be gone. They're, there's not changing with the times, they're going to be gone, which is partly true. But some said, I also, they said, you know, I think that there's, there's going to be changes, like shakeups and wake-ups, and so there'll be some change some morphing into something better and I think that's true as well um, so some were kind of like it's hopeless and some were like now there's going to be some changes and and even though you you probably have heard me seemingly making fun of religions I, I have um, <laughs> you'll also need to know that that I I explain that everything has its place so you'll hear me make making fun but it's not actually hatefully I just make it make silly some of the things that are so silly and ridiculous the things that are ridiculous like persecutions that some of them have pulled off you know so there's some silliness and some you know so on but I make light of it so that we lighten up and it's a light way of seeing through some of the dark pieces to these kinds of things but religions have a place and one of the primary places for religion is to kind of give people a foundation but it's more for basic people to give kind of basic people a basic foundation of spirituality. And so that's why they, they kind of they memorize rules and they try to live by these guidelines. And so spirituality, it's like you, you kind of move outside that box. Because the problem with religion is here are the guidelines, but then heaven help you if you ever move out of the guidelines. But spirituality is for people that are already out of the box. <laughs> They're like, yeah, I got the guidelines, let's fly. No, no stay on the ground. Well, airplanes, birds and such, they're not made to, to stay on the ground. I mean, they're, they're made, they can move, they can fly. So I think of it as sort of learning to write, learning the alphabet and how to make letters, but then expanding out of that. Eventually you take the lines off when you're, you know, uh, I learned to write probably in sixth grade. Now it's like when you're three months old. But <laughs> the lines we used to have to write within, and now you, you remove those at some point. You eventually take training wheels off the bicycle. And that's, to me, spirituality versus the other. Would you ever shame a child for using training wheels? I hope not. But that's what religion is. And that's not a rude statement. It's the truth. It's what they're there for. To give you some foundation, some, you know, some groundedness. So the basic traditions, that, that, that's, that's just perfect. And, but the day will come. Um, you know, all religions, traditions, customs, all things that people used to do within guidelines, eventually all that's going to fall away. And for religion too, it's going to be things that they won't change, things that do not morph will cause them to end. And the things that they're able to keep adapting will keep moving them in the right direction. And you know, many leaders of different groups and thought systems have asked me uh, to talk about this and to share because they trust my insights. And I've told them, if you don't, change and create like the next step for people, the next people will run past that next step and you'll be looking at the back end of those people because you're going to be still sitting there with the same old thing. So everybody's got their chance to, to kind of move and you know if you still go, I still like a tradition of some kind, that's fine. Remember, it's for basic things, for basic people, basic learning, basic guidelines. Call it for what it is, but don't expect generally don't expect religions to cut you loose, to train you in freedom, because that's not what they're designed for. And I'm not dissing what they are designed for, that's necessary, the training wheels. But 
there's a point where we go, God, I, I got it, you know, and you just get ready to fly. So the challenge with these places is, you know, these, these church, these traditions, it's, it's kind of a slow process. I mean, it really is. It's already been a couple thousand years just within the Christian traditions. And they've, they've been left in the dust by free thinkers and mystics, people that are going, I got it. I, I'm going to know what Christ consciousness is. What do you mean Christ consciousness? No, we want you to worship a person, you know, and certain statuaries and whatever else, you know, Jesus on the cross kind of a thing. So the other issue is that these traditions, these religions, there's not a single one of them that doesn't to some degree try to protect itself. Believe it or not, even Buddhist factions compete at times with one another. It's really strange, and that may sound, oh my God, I can't believe it. They're religions. They're all religions, and so there's a certain amount of, if you don't come here, you're going somewhere else. We want our money to grow, and we want our numbers to grow, because then we're a larger religion. And which, to a degree, they're saying that means we're spreading our word, which is understandable. But you're just not going to get something spiritual when you're worried about keeping things kind of under control. So there, you know, there are people that just, they still compete. There's still strange behaviors along those lines. So they, they protect this little thing. You know, the Latin, in the Latin languages, this, there, there's a word for this. Even though religions are protecting their little thing, you know, like this is our religion. We're going to heaven and you're not. And then the other's going, well, we will. We'll just keep reincarnating until we do. You know, so they're, they're all having their little thing. The Latin term for a little thing is called mafia. That's what the word mafia means. It's our little thing. So when religions have to protect their little thing, it's kind of mafia-like, you know? And, and strangely enough, they act like it. So what starts to happen eventually is... With all these religions, we learn to start embracing. We just, we learn to be open and embrace all of them. But some people say, oh, I embrace all traditions. And they don't even mean it. It just sounds really cool to say it. I honor, look, I even wear beads from every different religion, tradition. I don't know anything about what they mean. And I don't practice true spirituality, but I wear all the cool essentials. You know, like you've shopped at some sort of multi-religion, you know, bazaar or whatever, you know. So it's, it's like... We can say, I embrace all religions and traditions. And I've been to many centers, many, many people, and, and they, 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 they talk it, but they don't really mean it. You can go to some new age, new thought, unity, some unity, some religious science. We honor all traditions. And then you say, really, can we do a pagan ceremony? We're not really into that. You know, so immediately they show you there, there's, there's limits because they've got to protect their little thing. So it may sound cool, but really what happens is those of us who break out of the, the religious traditions, we start to say, okay, what's going to happen if I break out? Here's what's going to happen. You'll know where you are in this kind of um, movement. You start off with embracing when you're religious or even mystics. They'll start off with the basics, a religion or two that you most have an affinity to. Okay, cool. Some of you are going to go, that's me. Okay, cool. Then what's going to start to happen is you're going to embrace more traditions. So it's kind of cool. You, you know, you might go from one or two, but then you start to incorporate many traditions. And you start to go, I, I really honor all of them. I can see that they all offer something. And then there's a point where you say, I got it. You drop them all and you start to experience and live what was underneath them all. So it might start with one or two. You might expand to some more and then say, look at me. But, you know, I really draw from various traditions. Um, I'm a musician. I can play some native stuff and I can also play some Middle Eastern stuff. I have lyrics that I've written that are Celtic tunes or written, you know, something that's South American. Very cool. You're, you're diverse. You're eclectic spiritually, musically. Very cool. But there's a point where you've gone from a couple to many and then you go to a place at some point where you kind of drop them all. You're not dissing them, you're just dropping them because you become. And that's what a lot of us have learned to, you know, call uh, people that we learn to call mystics. Mystics are not a tradition, they're actually people that have kind of gotten the experiential. You know, they moved out of the dogma and they kind of went to, wow, actually living it, actually experiencing it. So 
you know, again, but each religion has a place. And I'm going to share a little, a little, I drew a little chart here because each religion is associated or has an affinity to any one of your chakras. So this is another way to look at it. There are no religions out there. There are only the religions that we project or reflect out there that are in here. So when you say I'm studying this religion, you're actually talking about reflecting one chakra or another or another or another. And all religions are going to be one of these four lower chakras because these are our human four chakras. So, and by the way, these, these chakras are still our human chakras. So that means religions can only at best reflect material for, of the human nature, which is a limited nature, which means religions can't actually launch you into spiritual experience. You would have to have an upper three chakra religion, and there isn't such a thing. Because religions are for mankind. Mankind is the lower four chakras. Make sense so far? So... How do I, you know, how do I break out of that and go up here? You don't have to break out. Let's learn these. Let's embrace these. These are me. And there's people, I swear, they eat, and they all protect themselves. Go, our religion is better. No, your religion is that chakra. Your religion is that chakra. Be quiet. You're all chakras. That's it. You don't have to compete and prove anything. That's like saying, can you surgically remove this chakra? It doesn't make any sense. Just love them all, man. They all have something to offer. So when we look at it, A Course in Miracles has a great quote which is something along the lines of a universal theology is impossible, but a universal experience is necessary. That's the difference. A universal theology, we're not going to get it to happen. Everybody's not going to convert to this religion or that one. Why? Because they're human expressions and humans do not know what oneness is. To have oneness, one belief system, one experience, you would have to float up here where God is one. But as soon as you start talking things, this ritual, that dogma, this you know, peace and that rule and that law, you're descending back into human and they divide. The one light goes through the prism and refracts into colors. So the one light of God comes through the prism, which is the veil across our, below our throat center, and refracts into our four lower chakras. Remember that on the Pink Floyd album? Anyway, okay. <laughs> So all these religions claim to want to introduce you to God, but they can't because they're human expressions. You see, all the religions are still human. That doesn't mean bad because if you say, okay, I get it. I don't want any of that. I just want to float up and be in God. Now you're a bliss bunny. You're ungrounded. We need you to show up here. We need you to show up here and be able to talk it. So, so to try to avoid all the other, the human expressions of religion or ritual or beliefs might be escapism and you have to watch for that. What would show healthier is I am and I'm willing to do. I am, how are we doing? Let's honor this Jewish holiday today. I am, let's honor and do this pagan ritual today. I am, let's do this. I am, let's do that. You see, and then you're truly embracing them all because you're coming from a different place. So the religions all have their place. So let's start with the root chakra. Clearly earth religions, shamanism, paganism, but it teaches you foundation and respect. Foundation, the, the root chakra. Even if you're all airy fairy, you need grounding. So come in here. Oh, I just love being one with the angels. Really, sit by this tree and center into the earth. Oh, but that's the material world, yeah. Whew. And that's where your checkbook is in the minus. You need to show up. <laughs> you need to show up and get a little root stuff going, some grounding. Wouldn't hurt for you to have sex, too. So, <laughs> with people that are actually in their bodies, you know. Okay, anyway. I snorted, sorry. Um, <laughs> navel chakra. If we're using earth, water, fire, air as our process. The water, emotional chakra. Water religions. The most well-known water religion is Christianity. People would want to go, no, Christianity's got to be higher. There's no higher. They're all equally important, all four centers. I swear to God they are. They're equal in this. So water religions. But what do the water religions teach us mostly? passion. Now, mis misdirected, 
the passionate Christian religions or water religions, you know, they do things like, yeah, you know, they get up there and do the televangelist thing and you are going to hell, you know, it, it's all, but it's emotional. I'll take the passion any day. I'm not interested in what you're saying, but I like the passion. That's kind of cool. The solar plexus chakra, fire religions, fire religions, man. There's some zeal and passion again, but it's also about focus and discipline here. Islam, Judaism, Zoroastrianism, you know, it's, it's, it's there. I mean, it's, it's the fire religions. They even have hot, drier places. It's fire. All religions have a little of each chakra, by the way. The Native Americans have fire rituals. I mean, they all mix it up a little bit, but generally they're, you know, in an area. So, but this is the mind, not the emotions. This is about discipline, which is why Muhammad was so adamant about have some discipline. He was telling some very undisciplined tribes and people they need to get their act together. Moses, here, there are some commandments you must keep. He was saying, basically, and we'll read, read between the lines, man, you people are out of control. You need to get it together. Here are some guidelines to follow. The heart chakra, almost all the traditions from the East. It's hard to pin Hinduism because Hinduism is so broad in so many ways, but I could say Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism. It's the air element. New thought traditions are very much more air. You know, so, so the air, and we think, oh, I like the air. That's very breathy and new agey and spiritual. That's nice, but how are you doing here? It's got to be equal, it's got to be balanced. So what we're learning just in that is technically, I could, would study all religions. Now, if I study them intellectually, what you're doing is you're becoming like a theologian or you're becoming an academic around religions. And what you're doing is by studying them so much, you're actually distancing yourself from ever being them. The more you study God, the more you distance from God, because so you, you want to analyze it. A shaman says, do you want to understand this lizard? Sit with it and be it. And imagine, if I am this lizard, how do I feel and how do I function? What foods do I like? And so on. What are my fears? What, you know, and so on. Just like you become it. Science says, to understand the lizard, we must kill it, dissect it, put it under a microscope and analyze it. And then even name some of the things we're looking at. And that's what we do. That's the left brain. That's the linear. The right brain goes, Whoo. I'm going to, what is it? I've shared this before, but Einstein, you go, oh man, Einstein, wow, he's a, wow, wow, he's a master. What a mind. So Einstein, can we interview you? You know, Albert, how did you come up with some of your great theories, theorems, your, your beliefs, like the, the speed of light? He said, not well. When you analyze it enough, and do the math, it'll show up. What he said was, I imagine that I am light beaming through the universe and then ask myself how I feel. <laughs> and the light answers and I get my ideas. See, like when I say, when I do talks, I do, it's like a search find. I just kind of think of a topic and then it all starts downloading, right? So that's how it's done. It's, it's more whole-minded. And any of us can use that in our lives, our specific lives. A doctor, a nurse could improve as a doctor, a nurse. When they, when they start to go, what's really happening here? What, what am I being called to do and what's really happening rather than linear? But remember, the linear world shames if you go outside linear. Religions, um, um, sciences, whatever it happens to be. Science, religion, politics. Like I said, those are the unholy trinity. You know, those are the antichrist. Because everything about them is trying to get away from feeling, knowing, believing, experiencing. So the heart chakra. And so all, all religions, though, in one way or, an, or another, the good news is they are in one way or another trying to introduce us to God. But they can't because they're still of man. But they're still at least, you could say, well-intended. Especially since they... they they just can't introduce you to experience. They can only introduce you to the history or some of the rules and laws and theories. They can't give you experience because it's like a religious science. It's like a science of religion to analyze. And so it kind of keeps you away from the experience itself. But again, what's nice is we can say, but I can still gain something from each of those. 
I literally have told people, if they're low on one chakra, their energy is low, you could tell them to study the traditions of that chakra and it'll help turn it on. Somebody that's too airy, we can talk to them about doing some earth work, some grounded stuff, you know, getting into the earth, onto the earth, connecting, and it could help balance that imbalance between the heart and the, the root chakra. So each religion might claim to take you to God, but by nature they're limited because they're made from humans. So the next piece I want to share is the, when we start to look at the, the history of things, technically, what's so funny? <laughs> Each of these, yeah, it's, it is. She knows what's coming, kind of, you know. When we start to look at these, I want to explain one more thing. If I said these are based on limited, but something's here, what is it that gets you here? Technically, the only thing that's ever been taught out there that can get you here is called Christ consciousness, or I am. It's God. Only God can take you to God. The, the humans can't. They can only talk about it. They can't get you there. So God, or what I call Christ consciousness. Now, what's nice is you can look at some of these traditions and these, these other people, the, the you know, root religions, the solar plexus religions, whatever they are, thought systems, teachers, and you'll not hear them praising each other. You don't usually hear Muhammad saying, saying wow, Lao Tzu. Wow, I mean, wow. Nor do you typically hear, you know, Buddha saying something about a, a Middle Eastern teacher. But you'll find that all of them talk about Christ. Buddha said there's a light-skinned person coming, prophet coming, that will take you beyond what I can take you to. He's not going to talk about reincarnation and clearing your karma. He's going to represent grace, which takes you above the doings of clearing your karma. Muhammad says, I had a vision of all the prophets of history, and Jesus was the capstone. He was the top. The Native Americans say there was this light-skinned one that came to visit us. Light-skinned one. And he wore a seamless robe and had marks on his wrists and feet. He is the teacher of teachers, the healer of healers. See, so all these various traditions, they got it. They knew it. The, the ascended masters, if you're into that, they talked about Jesus being the master of masters. All these various traditions. See, this is how I kind of found what I'm into. I went, I, I don't like to settle on something like a piece of something. I'm like, I, I'm open to studying all the religions. But for a moment, you think, if I study them all, then I get it, because it's all pieces, and if you get the pieces together, you know the whole puzzle. And I found, no, the pieces are still pieces of a puzzle, and it's still a puzzle. What causes the lines of each piece to disappear, and then the, the puzzle picture becomes a picture, and then the picture becomes an experience? What does that? And I went, God. So that's why I don't settle. I don't, I don't tell us to do and get caught in any one thing. I just talk about anything. What are we going to talk about today? Oh, let's, let's bring that in. Let's bring that in. Because they all play a part. And when I came into Sedona, some people love that because they go, we love being eclectic. So they go, this is Michael guy. He's like the eclectic of all eclectic. He can talk about anything. One minute he's 12-stepping, the next minute Zoroastrianism, and so on and so on. Wow. And they thought that was cool because they like being eclectic because that then becomes their religion, to do nothing except talk about sideways stuff. So eclectic, you're addicted to everything. But did any of it take you vertical? Oh no, we just want to talk some more about more stuff. <laughs> Michael's amazing, he can keep talking about stuff. Then I say, no, I don't, listen to me. I talk about stuff and then I take it vertical. And then I talk about stuff and then I take it vertical. Always back to God. And a lot of people got that and that's why the room is as full as it is, you know, typically. You know, it's, people go, there's something here. And it's to introduce people to God, to, to get back to God first. We can still talk about all the other stuff, but back to God. So there's really great rhyme and reason to all this. So, and another group though, and then there's the Jews talking about the coming Messiah. And the Messiah, we'll get into this, but the Messiah then is Jesus. So all these different groups are really talking about the same person. Someone that didn't start Christianity making Christianity the top religion, because it isn't. It's a water religion, just one religion. And it's emotional. It's all about guilt and shame. <laughs> but also the love of God. Jesus loves us. So it's still emotional, which is cool, but it can go south now and again. However, there's something else. There's another group, the Druids. The Druids are interesting because some of you will go, well, yeah, I heard about, you, know, you don't just hear about, let me explain this. If you ever heard the name Essenes, the Essenes are not just an interesting group. 
The Essenes are a group of the New Agers of that time. They're the Gnostics and New Agers of that time, 2,000 years ago and even more, 3,000 years ago. And they got together and said, all this horizontal stuff is really cool, but why don't we set something up to get us right back to God directly? which doesn't diss this stuff. It means embracing this, but only the essentials into one thing that helps you discipline and focus and so on, but to God. So the Essenes were taking us home. Okay, they were taking us home. They were like, hey, this is what this is about. The word Essene means expectant ones, like pregnant. The Essenes, we are the expectant ones. What do you, so you guys live in constant anticipation? Like that doesn't sound very centered, no. Expectant ones meant we are expecting the Messiah. We are expecting the Christ to come into body. And the pagans are going, well, yeah, we do that all the time. Every year we celebrate the coming of the sun, the coming of light to the world planetarily. And the Essenes go, yeah, but now it's actually going to happen. It's going to be embodied in someone. So everybody's going, oh, this is cool. They're seeing it in the stars, the Magi of Persia, you know, all the wise men, the three wise men, the birth of Jesus, you know, they're like, it's in the stars. Something's happening. Something's coming. Let's get ready for this. So the Druids are kind of like a, a priestly tribe, a, a priestly group for the Celtic people or, or all the, really all the Western European people. It, it, it's beyond just one little town or city or, or even a, a continent. It spreads a lot more than people know. But the, the priests of the Celts, and the Celts are called Kimri or, 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 or Kimerians or even Keltoi. But then they add the vowels for the O, o but instead of Kelt, Keltai or Keltoi, it, it, we call them Celts. But these priests, these are the Druids for the Celtic, for the Western European people. They're the, they're the Druids. And there's some remarkable similarities between them and the priests, the Levite tribe of Israel. So you go, well, that's amazing how things can be so startlingly, startlingly similar from one continent to another. It's not an accident. So I'll explain that. These Celtic people, these, these Druids are just like the priests of the Israelites. They believe in one God, they abhor uh, uh, idol worship, and they even used to walk around with a, a, a replica of the Ark, which the Israelite priests used to carry, the Ark of the Covenant. Remember uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? So the Druids are walking around with this replica of an Ark, and people are like, oh, we don't know, they must have heard a rumor and started making something up to kind of carry around. No. They knew about the ark. They actually knew about this. So they even believed in a coming Messiah, and they called him before he was born, Yesu. So the Druids knew about the coming Messiah. But the priests in Israel chose not to honor him when he arrived. But the Israelite priests in Britain honored him and expected him. The Druids are nothing but, we'll call them Jewish priests. That's all they are. Once again, they're just connected. They do the same thing. They wear the robes. They look the same. It's amazing. Almost, you know, breastplates at times. They had very similar garb and beliefs. So I think that's just fantastic. So the um, British people become, you know, they become considered to be, in, by and large, British. The British people, British means the covenant people. And that's what the Israelites saw themselves to be. We're the chosen ones. We're the covenant people. So it's really amazing. And the high priests are known to have walked into wars, some of the battles they had to fight to protect themselves. Because they're like, we are the protectors of the truth. And that's because the, the um, Druids were sort of a replica. They were a, a, a branch of the Benjaminites. There's 12 tribes of Israel. And the Benjaminites were the ones that were the warriors protecting the Jews in their worship and the priests. So in the Celts, you have the warrior Celts that are the Benjaminites that have traveled. And you have the high priests, which are like the Levites of the tribe of Israel, except they're Druids. So there's mention that they've gone into battle, the Celts, and they'll get the Druid priest out in front. And the Druid priests would wear their robes, the Druid priests, they would wear their robes, and they would have three golden rods on the, as symbols painted on the, the garb. And it was the rod of Aaron from the days of Moses and, you know, in the Old Testament. They would be the rod of Aaron. So why are they in Britain? Why is that there? In England, England meant the land of the angels or English, the angelic people, God-man or angelic people. There's something here, guys. It's so deep and so beautiful, but easily missed. 
So we say the Celts are, the Celts are made up of a couple races, the British, and then there's a meaning to the word British, the Saxons. Who are the Saxons? The Saxons are Isaac's sons, the tribe of Isaac, Isaac's sons, the tribes of Israel. And one of the tribes, you know, it's a, it's a heritage of Isaac. So the people that said we are Saxons meant to say we are a tribe of Isaac's sons. So what happens is during the Babylonian captivities and during the Egyptian captivities, most of us don't know. Babylon cap captured the, the people of Israel. But the people of Israel, that's not Jews. That's one tribe. Judah are called Jews. One tribe. And in the region, they were warring with each other. So they decided the Jews are going to live at one end of the Judean region and all the other tribes are going to live at the other end, more or less. So they all got ca taken into captivity karmically because they were fighting with each other. They all went into captivity. But people don't realize they also got out of captivity besides Moses, that story. That's just later. The Israelites left, but nobody knows where they went. So all we hear about are Jews because that tribe, most of them went back to Judah, Judea. And where'd the other tribes go? They went to Britain. They went to other places. And their name is sort of carried, but look at the tra tradition. So part of what I'm getting to is that those, those Druids were the same as Israel, chosen people. But one chose not to make the way ready for the Christ because you know, the Messiah and all that, but the other did. So we hear, for example, if you look in the Bible, you'll hear about Paul going off teachings. Jesus said, to the apostles, go off and teach the lost tribes. Where are they and why are they lost? Do you think they just hung around the Judean region? Are they lost? They're there. Where are the other several tribes? And we don't realize it. Paul, Peter, the apostles, where did they go? The lost tribes meant the tribes of Israel that took off in different places. The Mormons even talk about this and say, we believe the tribes influenced the Phoenicians and the Phoenicians came to America long before Columbus. There was so much more activity on this planet than people know. So much more interaction, but I'm talking about a spiritual purpose behind all this. So I'll get to that. So Jesus says, go and teach the lost tribes. Because the lost tribes and, and the Jews are holders of the, the, the root their light, and the fire, the mind. We're going to give you tradition, but we're going to give you discipline. So we're going to be the holders of the law. So they're holding this space so that we can make way for the coming of Christ consciousness. But some of them missed that, chose not to honor that, but the Celts did. That's why we have Christ as a, as a religion, but Christ consciousness was birthed in Jerusalem or the region, Judea region. Where though did it go after it was born? It was Europe, it was Britain. So Britain became the place where it grew as a consciousness. And I'm not just giving a history lesson, I'm saying there's reasons to this why the Druids were involved and why they said, we believe in Yesu, we believe in a coming Messiah. And then when Israel, uh, when Jesus was crucified and ascends, the people of Israel started murdering the Christians, started, you know, persecuting Christians and all that. They didn't know where to go or the families and the apostles of Jesus. So they got on a boat and they split with Mary Magdalene. They went to the south of France. She said, I like it here, I'll stay. The rest of them went to Britain. They said, you know, she said, I, I want more sunshine. I'm staying in France. <laughs> so the rest of them went to Britain. This is, this is recorded stuff. They go to Britain, and the, 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 the great uncle of Jesus, his name is Joseph of Arimathea, he gets to Britain, and people go, well, yeah, we heard he went there. He didn't just go there. The Druids were waiting for him. They were the Israelite masters that did accept rather than didn't accept. So they said, we're not only waiting for you, we've already prepared land, and they gave him. Thousands of acres, and it was permanently tax-free to Joseph and Mother Mary, who he was taking care of, and John the Beloved went for a little while, and some of the other, Philip and some of the other apostles, but it's amazing. So in other words, the growth of not just Christianity, because that's a weird thing, Christ consciousness was spreading. Well, it is, you know? It was spreading. So the thing called Christianity was it turned into a religion over time. Where did it go to do that? Rome. Who was running Rome? The Romans. Okay? They were into killing everybody. So the, the church became the holy, what a weird use of words, holy Roman Catholic church. 
And that's where that came from. And they said, and we're the one and original. Of course you're going to say that. You're Romans. You like to conquer everybody. So you're the one and only religion. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> so these people are going, there. let's follow the Druids. You know, it, it comes from the word Drus or different, different pronunciations. Uh, but Drus or Dru, Druid. And they say that's where the word comes from because it means oak. Right. But... It comes from the, actually from the word druthen, which means the truth. It means servants of the truth against the world. The Druid's true name comes from druthen, which means, you know, we're protecting the truth against the world. Ah, got chills when I even said that. Wow, okay, yeah. <laughs> She's having a cigarette after that one, okay? So think about this. The Druids, now the Druids are saying, we know they didn't accept you there. And I'm talking to you. You may not be accepted in your family of origin, but someone's waiting for you. The Druids are waiting for you, not literally, because even that can get corrupted. But religion starts coming up a little later. But the, the, they call it the, the apostles and the disciples of Jesus. They said, let's spread the light. They weren't talking about religions, but they were called bringers of the way, guardians of the way. Before it was called Christianity, it was called the way, because Jesus said, I am the way. So to study Jesus' teaching meant you were studying the way. The way what? The way home. The way to Christ's consciousness. It wasn't made dogmatic and religious. But Rome set out an edict and said, kill all Christians, and Christianity was growing in Britain. You don't just hear the, we think we're hearing history about how the Romans invaded Britain because they wanted to take it over. They wanted to kill and stamp out Christianity that was being developed in Britain. They went after Britain because of their beliefs. We think it was just war. It wasn't. They were trying to stomp out their beliefs just like people from your past, your religion, your family, whomever, your exes, try to stomp out not just you, but it's actually, believe it or not, they go after your light. They rape you, they molest you because not just dysfunction of humanness. They're trying on some level or another to stomp out your light. That's what it's all about. People, they may not know it consciously that that's what they're doing. They just think I'm just dysfunctional. I have addictions, I'm you know, misbehaving. It's underneath it all, it's a spiritual warfare. And people are trying to snuff out your light. So in Britain, the Romans kept going and trying to fight them. And, you know, historians will say, oh, but those Brits were so strong. And No, the Brits said, we're fighting for the truth. You cannot take freedom from us. We will not be enslaved ever. And we have beliefs, but the beliefs they were holding was Christ consciousness. You didn't fight people, as many people, fighting in Jerusalem for Christ consciousness. At best, they were just being put to death. In Britain, they said, no, not today. Because you and I all have to learn to honor our boundaries and essentially, like even Course in Miracles, Jesus says, you have to protect your inner ch Christ child. It's a weird thing to say. You have to protect it? Yes, because the Christ child is new in us and it's growing. So by us learning to set healthy boundaries and protect that, it can grow into maturity. So the Druids were protectors of the way. And the Celts were like, we'll fight to the death. And here's one reason why. They believed in immortality, just like the Knights Templar and just like the Cathars. They said there is no such thing as death. The Romans were like, we're pretty ferocious, but these people aren't afraid of us. And that's why they were fought off so well. And they never conquered Britain. At best, they could get a truce because they figured we just can't defeat them. But if you are the place that Christ consciousness gets developed and people keep trying to wipe you out, just do what the Druids and the Celts did. Say no. The ego doesn't actually have the power to conquer you, nor does the Roman Catholic Church, nor Rome, the Romans. They don't have the power to, to destroy us. They don't have any power except what we give them. And what we forget is during that time, Mother Mary's sitting right there in Glastonbury, where she lives in a, in a home, and she eventually passes away there. And there's other disciples of Jesus, apostles of Jesus, that come to say goodbye to her. So it's an amazing thing. This place is sacred, holy land, like Blake said. And did his feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountain green, you know, and was the holy lamb of God, right? It's, it's a beautiful prayer song poem that Blake wrote. And it was recorded by Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, but I'm just <laughs> mentioning it. The song called Jerusalem. You know, it's like there's this powerful 
Is it true that Jesus is associated with Britain? More so, Christ consciousness planted there, not in Jerusalem. That's it, you know, Jerusalem was like a child prematurely being born, but you get him to the right place for the health and nurturance. Born in the back of a cab, but you get him somewhere safe. So born in a place that didn't want it, accept it. Still has its beauty, still has its sacredness, but all the religions lost something somewhere, which was the experience. They wanted to keep the rules, the laws, and the little structures. Anytime you break out of that, they get a little freaky about it. So it's not an accident um, that I decided, uh, uh, someday, you know, someday I, I believe we're going to create a retreat. Uh, I call it Edenshire now, but we're going to create a retreat that's for people, just like these, these people into Christ consciousness went and the Druids welcomed them. We too are going to go somewhere and have a retreat where we, we can live and, and honor that. We'll be like, you know, a new version of Druids. But um, it's no accident, it's no accident that the president of our board is an acting Druid, but is dedicated to Christ, but is dedicated to Christ consciousness. Okay? It's not an accident. I'm serious. It's not an accident. And it's no accident that, that you know, all these things we talk about, I mean, it's for a reason. I'm not just like talking. There's purpose behind it. And when you, when you hear some of what I just said, some of you are going, oh, Knights Templars or Cathars or, and the Druids, guys, all of them are bearers of the light. For the longest time, my newsletter was called The Light Bearer because it represented the, the Druids and this group and that group and the Cathars and the Essenes, holders of light, not holders of tradition and dogma, holders of the light, first of all, light bearers. Let's show the way, light bearers. And those of us who recognize we're made in the image of God, which is light, and work on developing that remembrance of our light are called light workers. So it's a term I... Believe, you know, a lot of people say it's something I coined. I don't know, you know, but that's what's said. I, a long time ago in the 80s, I started using it and it started catching on. So it's become kind of a common term, light workers. None of this is an accident. You know, the, the old religions, I can tell you, they are in their own way going to fade away or they're going to change so much. Some of them will change so much you can't recognize them from a few generations later. It, that's what's going to happen in this world. So we can honor all religions, but not gratuitously. We can learn to honor all religions, all right? Wise, it's, 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 it's perfect, but they are a human expression. So let's honor religions as a human expression of our quest for spirituality. Fair enough? All right. But then we can also honor spirituality. Not Religions can be honored for our quest towards spirituality, but spirituality should be honored because it takes us to spirit. One takes us one level, the other takes us the next level. Is that all making sense? <sighs> okay. And, I, and it's no accident that I'm looking for a retreat up in uh, probably Colorado. But by chance, that's what we picked. And the place, the region we're looking is because this idea, this idea of a retreat is rooted partly in my retreat I had in Bellingham, Washington, and when we've been talking here in Sedona. Strangely, Bellingham, Washington is along the same latitude as Glastonbury, and Sedona is along this, close to the same latitude as Jerusalem. So all these things, the whys, why am I even saying this today? Why not last week and why not a week from now? All these things are somehow part of a design. And saying in another way, guys, this isn't the first time you or I, if you're into something like this, have done this. You know, some of you were the Celts, some of you were the Essenes, some of you were both. Some of you were the Knights Templars, some of you were the Arthurian Knights, and they were a real group. It's light work. We've done light work. Some of you in Lemuria did light work. Some of you did light work in Atlantis, and some of you didn't. Some people out there were naughty in Atlantis. But some of us, you know, but some of us... <laughs> Um, you know, some of us were doing light work even in Atlantis. And if you're in this and watching this, you're likely someone that tasted light somewhere along the line and became part of it. Uh, this isn't the first time I've taught. This isn't the first time you listened, worshipped, prayed, celebrated, laughed, meditated together. We've done this. Some of us did it as Anasazi. See, there's another word for light workers. 
the illumined ones, the ones that glow. And you watch History Channel, they go, oh, that must have been aliens. Uh, in some cases, because there are such things as light beings, higher dimensional beings that are also light workers. But not all other dimensional beings are into light, just like humans. You meet some, and they're into light, and some that are into darkness. And other species from other places, same thing. Some are malevolent, some are benevolent. But our job is to find the light, cling to the light, for lack of a better word, cling to the light and work that. Let's shine more light. Can I, can I light my candle on your flame, please? Thank you. And then you take that somewhere and light someone else's candle and so on. So the illumined ones, the shining ones, the Anastasi people, where did they go? Who were they? Oh, they were a native tribe. No, they weren't. Just interview the, the, the Hopi tribes, the Hopi people. And they'll say, no, they were not. They came before us. We're not actually blood, per se, blood descendants of the Anasazi that were here in the Southwest before the Hopi. The Hopi say they're their own people. They were taller, light-skinned. They had a glow kind of to them. People that do light work start to shine. Sometimes, for metaphysical reasons, that's there, but sometimes it's just an energy. Like, you know, and so the people that the, a pope saw children captured in Britain, brought to Rome to be slaved, enslaved. He saw them, he said, who are they? You know, and the, the, the centurion said, these are captive, captured children from England or Britain. And the pope said, yes, they are indeed, because the word meant God man or, or angel people. And this pope said, these people glow. But he didn't li literally, like metaphysically mean they glow. They had this amazing blonde, long hair, blue eyes, clear, just clear eyes. They had this amazing continence to them. See? And you're one of them somewhere along the line. And if you, if you sometimes go, well, God, not at all. I mean, I feel broken and, and, and I, I, I dress dark and I hide a little bit. That's because somewhere along the line, they broke you. But if you're still here, you weren't broken completely. It means they beat you up and it wore you down. Now you drop the cloak of darkness and you stand up and you say, I got it. I'm back. I fell asleep because we all get tired sometimes. I fell asleep. And now I'm, I'm awake again. And that's what it means to be born again. To say not today. There's all other, other colorful terms I could use for it, but... <laughs> but not today to say that to all the peoples of the and don't hate them and don't shame and hate you know wrong them and judge them just go wow not today and that's what these warriors did and the Romans were like what are we going to do with these people they just won't give in but it wasn't because they were from a different country it's because they had a real belief they believed in something real and they knew live or die that doesn't even matter we're connected we're, we're servants of the truth so do you think it matters? You kill us? We're still servants of the truth. Only good can happen to us when we're staying aligned with this. If we succumb to fear and, you know, Roman, the thumb of Rome trying to press us down, then we're not alive anyway. So we'd rather die alive than live dead. Let's take a few centering breaths. <laughs> On that note, let us pray. <laughs> <laughs> Let's tune out the stuff of the world. Let's take a moment to sort of marvel that everything's connected. Everything's connected. Whatever my beliefs, Anasazi, Hopi, this religion, that religion, whatever, they're, they're all just things along the way. They all have a place, this tribe, that tribe. What's amazing is the deeper connectedness of all these. There's purpose. There's rhyme and reason. And I choose to be part of the reason. I choose to be part of purpose, God's purpose. 
Even if the gears move slowly in this awakening process, I choose to be one of the gears that turn in righteousness, right consciousness, the right direction. Awakening rather than asleep. Then tune in for a moment. Just breathing out the world and being open, open, open. How do I connect to any of this? There's the traditional side of any of us. Well, I'm this culture, I'm that race, I'm that gender, I'm that religion. That's fine. We know all that. If you need to name that, name it and get it out of the way. But what else are you? So, taking all the traditional definitions and genetics of me, what if I go further, bigger, broader, and I start to realize I'm also like a Lemurian. Those ones that were living under the law of one, they called it. The children of the law of one. The children of light, even in ancient, ancient times, tens and hundreds of thousands of years ago. Does that feel familiar to me, whatever I might know about Lemuria? If I have an attraction to the lush, because that's what the continent was like lush, green, tropical, <coughs> motherly, peaceful, oneness, gatherings, gatherings of light, love, people gathering. They loved scent. They loved vibrational healing. They loved vibration. Does that resonate? What about other dimensional beings? The Andromeda system, Arcturian system, the Sirius system. It could be Pleiadian or Orion that you resonate with, whatever it is. Some nurtured light, some didn't. But just see what's familiar to you. Light beings. Do I feel any connection to light beings? Higher dimensional beings, multi-dimensional beings like the Arcturians, shining ones, beings of light. And the cultures on earth. Do I feel any resonance with the Anasazi, ancient southwestern people? Taller, light-skinned, and were said to be able to manifest water where there was no water. They were tuned in, they were connected. And then the Hopi say, they never died. They never got disease. They didn't die in That's not why they went away. They ascended. And on the other side of the planet, around the same time, strangely enough, the Cathars and the Knights Templar disappeared for the most part. How is that? The connection. These are waves of light workers coming into this world to make a difference. The Arthurian Knights. There's a reason why Arthurian sounds similar to Arcturian. The Arthurian Knights, the Knights Templar, the Cathars. It's okay if you feel a little warrior inside sometimes, instead of all just floaty kind of mellow Lemurian. It's okay that you feel sometimes you might have been persecuted because you might have been a Cathar, a Knights Templar. It's okay that you feel a little bit of a angst inside about authority figures, churches, politics, because that's what they do, control and often cause harm. Just see it for what it is and no longer hate or revile or shrink back from them. Stand in who you really are and recognize, even if I ever were persecuted, they have no power really. So I'm going to go back even in time and give myself power. When I was burned at the stake or hung or mistreated or made into a slave, I'm going to go back in time and tell myself, I'm sorry that we experienced that, but I'm giving you light that you forgot even back then. 
feel this light, feel immune to all that those people ever did to you, rather than just anchor more hatred or hurt about it like some people do. Light. Give yourself light. Even if you were a child slave, give her, him, light. Say, I'm here with you. You're allowed to pass through time. I'm here with you. And guess what? Look behind me. There's shining ones standing with me. Let that person, that man, woman, the one burning at the stake or wherever they are, show them they're not alone. Tell them, die well. Not believing in any of this. Moments after the persecutions, you're going to awaken to a whole new level of who you are rather than merely reincarnate with the hurt over this experience. So let's give them rebirth. Let's give them a new chance. I love you. Tell them. And there's a lot of love standing here with me. Christ consciousness itself is here with us giving you all the strength you need, all the courage, but also the guidance to know. If you're born again today, the guidance to know where you're led tomorrow. To bring your light, to shine your light, to bring your lantern. Trust and believe in this and spend just a half a minute more letting the truth of this download. You don't have to try to figure out or discern who you're talking to, what's talking, what they're saying. Just try instead feeling it. Let it download to you. And then become aware of all the other people in the room doing the same thing. And imagine, because it's true, people all around the planet, like watching us, are participating in this. Try to see, guys, we have a spiritual tribe. It's not better than anyone in the big picture. It's not better than it. It's just that we chose to be awake. We chose to do light work. And that's honorable. So I'm grateful that I'm making healthy choices. I'm grateful that I probably played a role in the past. And I'm grateful that you're all with me. We're saying that to all the other beings doing this. I'm so grateful you're all here with me. You give me support. You give me something to feel like there's, I'm not alone in this. So feel that gratitude and visualize how cool it is. It's as though all of us shed the body and we're all beings of light now. And it brings up feelings like, thank you. It brings up feelings like, yes. It brings up feelings like, there you are. All kinds of wonderful insights. And then just gradually, slowly, but gradually stretching out. Acknowledging this is permanent in my consciousness. This isn't something we talked about and it's gone. Meditated and gone. This is permanently in me, as me. I'm part of something very powerful, very unique. And I'm grateful that I'm part of that. And so it is.